to this uh, second part, what makes and what breaks a high performance home beyond build quality. So for those of you who didn't see the uh, last webinar, um, I was really just dealing there with the, the shell and the fabric and looking at the assumptions in the NatHurst House Energy Rating software that it assumes of the build quality. And then looking at how one can meet those assumptions um, with standard construction uh, techniques so that you can um, make sure the house on the ground performs as per the star rating. Um, this talk takes a similar, um, uh, a similar model to the last one where um, I go through different areas of the energy use in a standard home and look at the low hanging fruit to pick and also look at um, pitfalls to try and avoid. Um, it also uses this particular graph uh, quite a lot throughout the presentation. I'm a Victorian builder. Um, Victoria has the highest carbon intensity uh, for our homes um, of any state. Um, and so uh, even if you're not from Victoria, this is actually a useful pie graph to, um, to, look, to look at and think about. Um, your pie graph from your state will be very similar, except in your state, most uh, in, in Victoria, um, we're very similar to Tasmania and the ACT in that we are heating for most of the year. So our space conditioning wedge tends to be very large compared to some of the warmer states. But the actual amount um, of energy that goes to our appliances, cooking, lighting and water heating for the average home is pretty similar. Um, so this should hopefully also be relevant to you if you're listening from other states. Um, just on this pie, this pie um, represents if you've got all the new homes, all the old homes, all the existing stock, and you averaged it all out and you see where the energy goes, this is the pie for the average house. The average house is about 200 square metres. Um, in Victoria, most of the homes are dual fuel. So if you've got the gas bill and the electrical bill together and you converted the megawatts, um, sorry, megajoules to kilowatt hours and combined it with the electrical bill, you'd get an average of 52 kilowatt hours a day um, use and of that energy use that um, burning of fossil fuels to provide that energy creates 8.8 .8 tonnes uh, of carbon dioxide every year for the average home with an average bill of 2,686. And um, as we go through this presentation, look at the pies as you're playing along at home, um, I think it's sort of easy to think about this pie if you quartered it Every time we save a quarter of the pie, that's roughly about two tonnes of carbon dioxide every year for the life of the house that you've saved. And also somewhere around about $600 you've saved for um, the homeowner. Okay, so this is where we finished the last um, webinar after looking at the build quality that we need to meet the house energy rating assumptions. So that if you get a six star home and you build it to those assumptions, you should save um, you know, that much uh, energy um, compared to the standard home. If it's a seven star um, design and you build it to the assumptions, that's what you get for seven stars. So you can see how the amount of space heating and cooling really goes, um, gets eaten away by good design with good, good build quality. So build quality, very, very important. Nine star and 10 star is a house that theoretically needs no mechanical heating and cooling. Of course, it is just theory because it doesn't look at extremes of temperature um, in the house energy rating software. Um, but there's two things I'll say uh, here. The first thing is that if you have a U-Butte um, passive solar or fantastic passive house design, and you, know, you can build it to this sort of standard and get this sort of performance, but if you don't, also look at the technology they put in it, you're going to find it very hard to get to a carbon zero outcome. And when I do judge uh, housing competitions, I'm always very disappointed if I have a lovely design, um, but they've obviously put all of their thought and con concentration onto the design and the build and then haven't thought about what they're putting in the home and the effect of the energy um, from those choices on the house. Okay. So that's the first thing. The second thing is if you, um, most builders don't get the option of, of doing a design build like, like I do. And so you'll just have to build whatever passes your desk, um, more or less. 
Now, if you have to build a six-star home, I don't want you, you know, there's no reason why that can't be a high-performing home as well. So don't think that, you know, it's just going to be same old, same old. The technology is such these days that with wise choices, um, you can get a very low energy home and potentially a, a carbon, you know, carbon negative home, a carbon zero home, uh, if you, you know, choose the right appliances. So this whole presentation is actually a good news story for the building industry. And I hope some sort of roadmap, as I show here, um, to how our industry could become, you know, one of the first in Australia to move to a, a low carbon economy. All right, so let's get into it. What is the first bit of technology? The first part of, bit of important technology is heat pumps for space conditioning. In fact, heat pumps are gonna be a bit of a theme. They are a game changer in our industry um, and should be used more. And, you know, you might be thinking, hang on, what is a heat pump? Here we have an air conditioner sitting up on the wall. An air conditioner is just another name for a heat pump. Some people call them split systems, heat shifters. They're all names for the same thing. They'll have an indoor unit and some sort of outdoor unit. Um, now, these um, in the past, if, if I go back about 10 years or so, um, these would have been a big no-no to put in a sustainable building because air conditioners only ran at one flat speed um, and they used a lot of energy. And so you wouldn't want to put your name to a sustainable home and have you know, air conditioners in it. That whole equation has turned and flipped completely on its head. They are no longer energy guzzling. They have inverted technology. They only put it, they only heat as much as they need to, to, to keep up the temperature. Um, in fact, there's a lot of technology. This is a Dakin US7 and I'm putting quite a few of these particular models. These particular ones have a humidity sensor built into them. So no more of that dry nose that people have been, you know, some people may um, not like air conditioners because they feel it dries them out. Well, now you can set the humidity uh, on them. Um, it can also, it's got a third pipe, so it can bring in fresh air. Um, it filters that air. Uh, it uh, cleans its own filters. It can be set to um, turn off when no one's in the room, because so it can sense if you're in the room, and you can link it to a smart uh, network if you want to. So very sophisticated technology, and I don't get any kickbacks for, for anything that I'm uh, suggesting today. Um, but why do we put it into, why am I suggesting it for a net zero home? The reason is that um, if I compare it with your standard, say an electric bar radiator or a gas wall heater, the most efficient that those things can ever be is 100%. If 100% of the energy that goes into the unit ends up as heat in your room, that's the most it can ever be. These things start off at about 300% efficient and go up to 600% efficient. Now, I know that sounds just completely bonkers and it sounds like I'm breaking some rule of thermodynamics. So let's have a look at how they work. The reason they get these efficiencies is because they're not actually making heat. They are just shifting it from the outside to the inside when you're heating and from the inside to the outside when you're cooling. And this is my idiot's guide, if you like, from an idiot <laughs> on how that they how they work because they're actually uh, reasonably complex machines. But inside, you'll see that there's a looper pipe that goes around in a squiggly fashion between the indoor unit here and the outdoor unit on the outside. There's two fans, and inside of that pipe is a refrigerant, and that refrigerant is just a gas. And the property of a gas is that if it expands, it gets cooler. Uh, and if it shrinks, if it gets compressed, it gets hotter. And you may have felt this yourself. Um, if you go camping and you, and you undo a, a gas cylinder or a gas cylinder on barbecue and you don't do it quick enough, you'll get that shoot of gas at you and it's really cold. That's because it's expanding out and so it feels cold. And you might have felt the other one if you're pumping up a bike tyre with a hand pump. You'll notice that at the end that you sort of squash the air at, that gets really hot. That's because you're compressing the air. And it just uses that principle. And so what happens here is the refrigerant comes through this expansion valve, expands, and it goes down to around about negative 40 degrees or so. Now, the air outside might be zero degrees, might be negative five, but compared to negative 40, that air is really warm. 
and the fan blows the air across the pipes here. The heat goes from the air into the refrigerant. It then goes around and it gets compressed through the compressor. And then all that heat gets squashed into a small space and the pipe becomes very hot and it goes to the indoor unit. Now it's all very hot and condensed and a fan blows across those hot pipes and blows heat into your room. In the process of blowing that heat into your room, it's also cooling down the refrigerant in the pipe, which then goes back out, gets expanded again, goes down to that negative 40-ish and the process repeats. And so that's how it heats. In cooling mode, just runs exactly the opposite way and takes the heat from the outside, inside and dumps it onto the outside. Now, doing this, this is a really important thing to know about coefficient performance because this is what you're looking at. A coefficient of performance is simply a ratio of how much energy it uses to how much heat it shifts. So if it uses one kilowatt hour of energy to run for an hour to pump this refrigerant around and it shifts three kilowatt hours of heat from the outside air into your house, that's a, a COP or a coefficient of performance of three. If it shifts four kilowatt hours of heat, that's four. If it shifts five, that's five. And the best are almost at six kilowatt hours of heat being shifted for every kilowatt hour of electricity used. So absolutely magical, amazing machines. Um, the EER, the energy efficiency ratio, that is exactly the same number, but that's just when it's in cooling mode to tell you how um, efficient your cooling mode is there. If you want to know more, go to this, the energy mind, engineering mindset. That's where I got this information from. Okay. Now, what you just saw then was what they call a single split system. That's where you've got one head on the outside and you've got a motor, sorry, one motor on the outside and one head unit on the inside. But you can link multiple head units on the inside to one larger motor. One thing to know about doing this process, though, is that for some reason, I'm not quite sure of the engineering behind it. The bigger the compressor size, this is sometimes known as a compressor, this motor, the bigger the compressor size, the more, uh, the less, sorry, the less energy efficient it is. It goes down a little bit, not too much, but a little bit. So the most efficient thing you can do is do a lot of single split units, but um, sometimes space is at a premium. And so we just put on the one motor and link it to multiple heads. Um, now, I know also some people don't like to see, they want to go more of a slim line, a clean line look, and they don't want things hanging on their walls. Well, you can have ceiling units that go into the ceiling. You can also have units that you build into bulkheads and they'll have a, just a, a, a vent, vent grill over the front and it'll look exactly like a ducted system. You can also have radiators. Uh, you can even put in, if you want to have ducted air still, no need for it, but you can still put in a ducted air system if you want, run by a reverse cycle air conditioner that makes the heating and the cooling. This, the efficiency of this will be down though, just because it has the inherent problem of ducting through an attic space where it's cold, losing heat out of that duct. And also, um, if you did see the last webinar, you'll know that part of the tightness membrane of, an, of standard construction is the plaster. That's what you've got to use to um, stop unwanted heat flow. And if you're cutting in vent holes um, for all of your ducts everywhere, it's very hard for that to be a nice tight building fabric. If you do want to know how to uh, get these a bit more efficient, though, I would check out this YouTube clip by Efficiency Matrix. If you haven't checked out their YouTube channel, they do some fantastic stuff on building tight. Uh, this particular one is, is all about the return air grill, which is notoriously leaky in a house. You can also do hydronic units. Not a great picture of that particular hydronic unit, um, but we we put uh, we did this house a little while ago now. But the um, the boiler on the outside is no longer gas. We used a, uh, a heat pump boiler, a coefficient performance four point two from memory. So that's another option. You can also run it in the floor if you want to go that way. Okay, what to look for? So when you get a quote what you want to do is you want to check out the specification document to see how efficient the unit that's been quoted is. So when you get a specification document, it'll look a bit like this. There will be a code for the indoor unit, a code for the outdoor unit, 
And this one is a 2.5 kilowatt system. The, the codes usually um, reflect the cooling uh, efficiency or the cooling capacity rather than the heating capacity. So you get a heating capacity and cooling capacity, usually heating capacity is higher on the same unit than the cooling capacity. So a, a 2.5 kilowatt system, typically you use that in the bedroom. The 3.5 may be a, a bigger room or study and the five is probably some sort of open plan room uh, and larger, it goes up from there, depending on the size of the space. But the number that you want to look at here, you want to go down to this EER, energy efficiency ratio or COP. Because we're in Southern Australia, we're heating for most of the year, the COP is the one that's the more important. And here, this is the, that Dakin US 7, best in class, at least as far as I know at the moment. Um, it has a COP of 5.81, like I said, approaching six. The other thing to, uh, that's good to bear in mind is the size dimension. So here's the indoor size and the size of the motor on the outside. And it's good just to check that they're actually gonna fit in the spaces that you want them to fit. The refrigerant is really important. And the next slide, I'll talk about that. And this maximum pipe length, because they're a split system, you wanna make sure that if you're specifying them or if you're designing them, um, that they will reach, like that the pipe between them will reach. And if 10 meters isn't enough in your situation, you need to go to a different model that has a longer maximum pipe length. Okay, check the refrigerant type because of its global warming potential. Um, we did a post about this, but it's worth going over again, just to really drive it, uh, drive it home for those who haven't seen the post. So unfortunately, the refrigerants that make these systems work and make them so amazing are themselves potent greenhouse gases. In fact, much more potent than carbon dioxide. This one here is best of class for an air-to-air -air heat pump. And it uses this R32 hydrofluorocarbon. And molecule per molecule, um, it's 670 times worse or, or more potent as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Now, the average um, air conditioner motor will have about a litre, about a kilogram of um, refrigerant in it. Now at end of life, if that refrigerant goes to atmosphere, that would be equivalent to, if it was R32, 675 kilograms of CO2 going to atmosphere. But that's best of class. The average, or the, the usual one being used in Australia is this R410A, and that would be equivalent to two tonnes uh, going to atmosphere. So if you are doing renovations or demolitions where you're getting rid of the old um, reverse cycle air conditioners, they must be um, decommissioned by a, you know, a registered plumber and they will take up that, um, that refrigerant and they'll bottle it and send it off for reprocessing and reuse. Uh, now, from now on, we're actually uh, including this in our handover manual too. The owners should really know this stuff. The other thing, if you haven't used these before, is to know that they'll all have a, a drip uh, pipe a condensate pipe um, and that isn't pumped so it has to run on grade and it discharges by gravity so you have to make sure that you never go uphill with that pipe or else it will block the unit it can run down like this um, out onto surface make sure it's grading away from the house um, it's probably better and neater instead of having a, a wet little part little trickle on the outside of your house to run that into storm water um, if you're on the upstairs, this is not a bad way to do it, is to run that condensate pipe into the gutter. Um, and this is from the VBA, you're allowed to do all of this. <laughs> uh, you can also tap them into downpipes, as long as it's not a charged downpipe taking water to your water tank. And I've also done this a couple of times if, because of the structure of the house on an internal room, you just can't get that condensate pipe to the outside of the house on grade, you can potentially run it to uh, an internal wet area and put a, put a tonne dish like this in a, underneath the basin um, in, and have the condensate line come out in the bottom of a vanity and then into that tonne dish. Um, also remember, again, if you haven't installed these, that each time you put a motor on, each one of these motors has its own dedicated circuit that has to go back to the board. So just make sure that, that gets roughed in, hard to do it later. 
And lately I've become very aware of this, mind the gap. So all of the motor units have to have at least 150 mil gap behind them so that the air for the fan can come in and that it can run efficiently. Now that's fine when you've got a utility area like this at Hillside Home, um, where it's been created for the purpose. But often these things are on a blind side of a house and you've only got a meter down on that blind side access way. So owners will be able to walk past, but let them know um, you wouldn't be able to get a wheelie bin past typically and or nor a wheelbarrow. So anyway, just things I've learned from hard, hard experience there. All right, now this is a real pitfall, I think, of the whole system. Um, and this is when the pipes come through you very often will get a big hole cut in like this. This happens, and it's typically, this is a standard installation. In, installation. It's not a bad installation. That's because these pipes are not particularly bendy, at least on some models, not particularly bendy. And if it's come down through the stud work, it needs quite a big turning circle to get out. And so they have to cut these holes to actually fiddle with their pipes and, and get it working. If it is um, a back to back, so it, if it is an external wall and you've got the motor directly on the outside of the wall, yes, you should be able to go through um, straight and with a much smaller hole than that. So what to do about this? Because this, this is just a terrible thing for your air tightness test when you do it. Um, and also more to the point, when you're trying to heat the home, um, you'll be getting cold air potentially coming in the back of the very unit that's trying to heat. And likewise, when you're trying to cool the home, you'll be getting hot potential air blowing out around the unit as it's trying to cool. What do we do about it? So this is a hard one. And if anyone's got better ideas, let me know. Uh, but what we do is we stuff this with insulation bats just around here so that it makes it hard for air to flow. Um, and then we get one of these kinetic <laughs> kinetic plates. <laughs> um, and the unit, you see, gets put up on the wall. And the very last thing, you can't sort of gap it until it's up on the wall. And then it can tilt out once it's up on its, on its uh, hanger on the wall. Uh, and we cut a little hole in one of these uh, connect plates and we sort of slide it up and fiddle it in and, and get it reasonably tight around the pipe. Um, it's not a perfect solution. Uh, it won't give you complete no, uh, you know, no air ventilation seal. It's more like the sort of hole that you get for your standard PowerPoint um, when they do the air tightness test, but it's a lot better than it would be if it was a big square hole. If you've got better ideas, let me know. Um, I really think that the manufacturers themselves should come out with a better way of doing this. Okay, so once, uh, so here's our builder, six star builder, but he's put in um, air conditioning and the, you know, some rooms have COP of four, the main area may be closer to COP of three. So he's able to achieve, let's say an average COP of just over three. What that means is that he can provide this much heating and cooling of this wedge that he's got left after he's built his house really well. Um, he can provide it with about a third of the energy of the COP of three. So wacko, there's a, a third gone. You can straight away see the huge part that this technology can play um, for the building industry. Now, of course, it's COP of four. Um, it would be even more. Oops, that just went the wrong way, didn't it? <laughs> COP of four and COP of five. There we go. But let's say we're back at an average um, coefficient performance of three, which is probably more of what you'd get in reality over the whole house because, uh, because like I said, the higher COPs are really only the, the smaller uh, units, which are good for single rooms, and then they go down a bit. Um, but that's the sort of performance that you would expect. So tick, we've done the air conditioning here. The next wedge here is for your hot water. And there are two strategies here. The first strategy is to limit the amount of hot water that you need. So the way, this is an, an easy thing to, to do. So I won't spend too long on it. But simply going from a three star shower head to a four, uh, to a four star, which is seven and a half liters per minute shower head. In, and you save about 15% of that um, hot water 
uh, of your hot water needs on your house. There is a slight pitfall to this though, and that is that it's no good just putting in a shower that gives you a poor shower at seven and a half litres. You need a shower that's been designed for low flow. Now, we've used a lot of these methven satin jets, um, so I'm, I'm perfectly comfortable with those, and we're actually trying one of their Aura jets now. I haven't tried it yet, but it's got a good, uh, good report and looks uh, pretty funky. Uh, so that's all I'll say about that. But Go for a four star shower and you can cut your hot water needs a little bit. The other thing, so the shower use half your hot water goes to shower and a third of your hot water goes to your washing machine, typically in a home. So that's the other one to focus on. There's really two parts to focus on there, shower and washing machine. And later on, I'll uh, go over how one might um, uh, encourage the owners to go more efficient on their appliances. But if you do, you could, um, expect to see about a 15% saving in that hot water wedge from the washing machine. So you do both of those things together, shower, washing machine, and you've cut down the actual hot water that you need by about 30%. Okay, the next step is to use an efficient hot water system. And lo and behold, it looks like a heat pump again. Yes, it is. <laughs> um, so, same deal, heat pumps can make hot water just like they can make hot air. Choose a heat pump with a COP of 3.5 plus, that's um, realistic for a hot water system. Look for systems that can be set to heat during daylight hours and that view will become uh, more apparent when we look at photovoltaics um, in a minute as to you're gonna be making heaps of power in the middle of the day. So if you can get a system that works with that, that's you get that synergy of technologies um, that make things very efficient. And again, check refrigerants. Um, now I do wanna point out here lagging because um, hot water pipes can get very hot. In fact, inside of this thing, it can get up to hundred degrees or thereabouts. That's why it's got a pressure relief valve here if it gets too much pressure inside, it will let some of the water out to reduce that pressure. Now, this is a really nicely lagged job. And thank you, Brian from iSmart for sending this through. Good job. Um, especially impressed with how neatly it goes through the cladding there. And I bet my bottom dollar that on the other side of that cladding, uh, he has taped the membrane around the pipe so there is no air penetration and he's put the insulation nice and tight around that pipe uh, on the inside as well. Um, watch out for that with standard builds. Plumbers are notorious for just putting through pipes and not thinking the broader picture about insulation. If there are um, plumbers watching, forgive me. I know you're amazing too. Um, but really everyone on site needs to check for penetrations through the fabric. One thing that I will point out here, in fact, two things. One is the insulation on the valves themselves. They get really hot if you put your hands on them. That's great. You can get them pre-insulated like that. If you've got one that is just showing the metal, you can get these things called valve cozies. I know Renew used to sell them that will go over and protect that. And I'm particularly impressed, Brian, with this particular lagging down the overflow relief pipe. This is almost always left off completely, but don't forget copper is extremely conductive. And when that pipe is getting cold at night, it'll just be sucking heat out of this tank. So that also really should be lagged. So well done there. The rules on lagging. Um, this is another little bugbear of mine. So I'll just quickly point out, if you look at the plumbing code, AS3500, it will have a little map of Australia and will have zones A, B and C. Uh, Melbourne is in zone B. Uh, most of the capital cities actually, there's a bit of A that goes down to protect Perth and, uh, and Sydney and uh, down Tasmania, they're either in B or C. But if we look over at climate zone B over here, you'll see it says that pipes on the external house should be lagged with R0.6 and it goes down here, R0.6 is 25 millimetre diameter, um, well, 25 millimetre thick, sorry, of the, um, of the polymer around the pipe, 25 mil each side. So um, check that. Uh, I, I have a feeling that most people only put on the 13 mil. And even if you're in other states, it's not a bad thing to upsize from this, which is the bare minimum. 
And lastly, make sure it's UV stable or else in 12 months or so, um, the UV will get to it and it'll start falling off. All right, you do those things for the water heating. And once again, if this unit has a COP of three, um, then effectively you can produce this much heat with a third of the energy. Why go? If it has a COP of four, bam. So you can see how heat pumps are really just eating away at the energy use on this pie. Lighting is the next one. And the simple solution here is, is LEDs. I've shown this picture before, um, but just be aware, this is really the only pitfall. These may all be LEDs, but if you put a lot of downlights in, remember plaster is your tightest membrane on standard, standard construction. It will be very hard to make this place um, work thermally at all with as many uh, lights in. Um, if you are putting in downlights as well, make sure they're ICF rated so the insulation can be run at least over the top. So at least it's insulated. Otherwise you have to pull back the insulation on the ceiling side as well as having holes in plaster. This sort of thing where lights hang down into rooms will have much smaller holes in your plaster and it will be a lot cheaper for the electrician to wire. And if you do that, you should be able to save around about 30% compared to the average home on lighting. And cooking. Cooking is another easy one. There's only one piece of technology that's really um, changed in the energy efficiency space, and that's the induction cooktop. So the indu induction cooktop, 50% more efficient than gas, um, primarily because you don't lose gas around the side of your pans and your pots. Uh, also, they perform extremely quickly, similar to gas. You, know, you, you turn, the, turn the knob and you'll get um, instant performance, similar to gas. Uh, and I actually went out to our Facebook group. Yes, we have a Facebook group, everyone. Um, I suggest you, uh, if you have any questions, that's where you should go. Um, and the feedback on people who use these was uh, amazing. Everyone was raving about them. So not only do they look fantastic and easy to clean uh, and more energy efficient, but uh, they also work really well. Uh, now, they don't use a huge amount of power either way. You save a little bit using this, but the, the main thing that I like with this is that the cooktop is often, once we've gone through this process, is often the last gas appliance in the house. And if you get rid of a gas cooktop and change for an induction, you can abolish the gas meter and effectively save your $300 a year or so um, of just having that meter uh, on site. So that's for the life of the house too. So that makes, uh, makes a lot of financial sense. The things that I will say, some tips, this is more tips really than, uh, than pitfalls, but some of the uh, induction cooktops have different amounts of ampage that they need for their power supply. So the normal one that we'd be running for a gas cooktop is a 10 amp cable up there but it might require a 20 amp or a 32 amp or a big one might even require 42 amps. Um, so you need to know that early. So you need to know the model at rough in stage builders and you need to get the, the model information from the owner so that you can rough in the correct thing. It's too late to rough it in once all the passes up. Uh, the other thing to bear in mind is that once you have heat pumps and for space heating, hot water system, and you've got an induction cooktop, unless you've got a very small house, there's a very good chance that you will need to upgrade from single phase um, power to three phase power. This actually, be, even though it's a little bit more expensive, it's sort of offset by the fact you don't now have to plumb a, a gas, a copper pipe all the way to the cooktop. Um, and it becomes a very good thing later when we're looking at how much PV you can put on. So if you do put on an induction cooktop, you can expect to save again out of this little wedge, about a third of it. There we go. You don't save more because there's obviously other things that use energy in the kitchen, ovens and microwaves and so forth. All right, this last section is a little bit of a, well, I wouldn't say contentious, but it's often left alone and it's in the realms of the owner to work out their appliances, as it should be. But builders have a unique position during the build as experts on the build. And in fact, designers have a, 
the same sort of expert status during the design process. And often owners will be coming to me asking for suggestions or what do I think of this appliance and that appliance? It doesn't hurt at that stage to give them, a, a, you know, some energy efficient versions that you would recommend. So if I break down, sorry, if I break down this wedge here and we have a little bit of look and I turn that wedge into its own little pie graph, you can see how the appliances break down and I have, <laughs> we've also posted this at Builders Declare, but it's worth looking at again. The big energy user here is fridge because it's on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Um, so that's a, a good one to get right and get efficient. TVs are, can, are reasonably big as well. That's a good one to get right. Pools, if you're having a pool, definitely look at the pumps. And if that's a heated pool, even more energy will be used. And freezers, dishwashers, clothes washers, all your white goods together also make up a reasonable chunk of, um, of your appliance energy use. The miscellaneous, that's just things that get plugged in over time and home entertainment and consoles and things that I do think is in the too hard basket. But the, I'm oh, sorry about this. <laughs> um, I assume everyone can still hear me. Um, the, uh, how, what do you do now, now that you know this? Okay, so this is what I do, just as a way of communicating some ideas of things to look for for the clients. I make a list of all those appliances and I put down the brand and the model, a description of them, and I put down what the rating is of them as well. So let's have a look. And then I give this to the clients. And this is my suggestion. So for instance, the fridge, you know, this is a, a high sense and that's the code. Six out of 10 stars, Australia's highest ranking fridge. Or dishwasher, you know, five stars out of six. Um, and 5.5 stars out of six for water rating as well. So I say what the rating is and also what it sort of goes up to. And that gives clients an idea that when they go shopping, well, they'll check these things out. They'll either choose, or usually they choose sort of half the things I recommend anyway. And if not, they tend to choose something around that inefficiency. They know that, um, you know, I've chosen something very efficient. They probably don't want to disappoint me too much. Um, and they come back with something in the ballpark. So uh, anyway, that's what I would suggest uh, you do there is make your own little table of suggestions. A good place to get the information to fill out that table is www.energyrating.gov.au. They run this whole star rating thing, which is quite a robust system and all of your white goods are represented there. You go to that website, click on search registration database. You can choose a product. In this case, I've chosen a fridge freezer and then you can just press rank them by star rating. There's 233 in this particular search. Uh, and that's where, that's where I got that high sense from. I then did a product review online, saw what people thought of it. People liked it, let's put it in. Another place to get really good information is the Choice Magazine. Um, it's a reasonably cheap subscription, goes for a year and they keep updating you with what is a good appliance and what isn't a good appliance. So, that's always a good one to fall back on. And of course, Builders Declare have their own socials and provide plenty of information. But if you're asking after a specific question, um, if you're not already, go to the Builders Declare Facebook groups page. I'm trying to grow this thing as a hub where builders can come and they can share information with other sustainable builders, trying to create a sustainable builders alliance. So if you wanna be part of that, come to that page. So just with a little bit of information, clients very often take some on board. If they don't, they don't, but it, it's such a simple thing to give some information. Um, and if they do go for higher star appliances, the sort of saving that you'd expect is somewhere between 30 or 40%. And so look, look at what we've done to this pie here. We've really decimated the thing. We've probably saved uh, around about two thirds of the pie just through efficiency. So well done if you've got this far. The next step is to use photovoltaics typically to offset it. This is the next step of the puzzle on the roadmap. All right, so this here was the, uh, this is the first house back in 2012 uh, that my client sent me his bill or in credit 
of, uh, they had a three and a half kilowatt system and they were in credit for the, you know, $454 back in the heyday of the 60%, uh, 60 cent uh, rebate per kilowatt. Um, now, back then we were specifying a lot of gas. So we had gas hydronics and gas cooktop and gas, uh, solar gas hot water. Uh, so I don't exactly know whether this house was um, 100% carbon zero, but I'm sure it was sort of in the ballpark. That is giving out <laughs> enough electricity to offset um, its energy use in the realm of gas there. Um, more recently, this is a house that we built a bit over two years ago. So I've got two years of data. This house is 100% electric, 4.8 kilowatt system. Uh, it only draws 0.6 of a kilowatt per day as a net result. Obviously, it's drawing more at night and during the winter, it will draw more, but during the summer, it will output a lot more. So the net balance is approaching zero there. And this is a renovation that we did that has a similar, this one's 3.3 kilowatt hours a day with a 4.7 kilowatt system. Didn't even have a north roof on this one um, because of the way the block was shaped, uh, but does have east and west, but still getting very good um, net sort of outcomes there. So I just show those just to show you um, that it's really possible for the building industry to move to a much lower carbon intensity. Um, not particularly difficult, I don't believe. And that brings me to my PV system sizing rule of thumb little diagram here. Um, now, this is just a ballparking exercise. So don't go writing me letters if it doesn't work for you. However, I find it um, it's pretty accurate in, uh, in um, predicting for myself um, what, uh, what sort of system size we should be going for to break even. And the way I'll explain this thing um, is just by doing a demonstration. That's probably the easiest. So let's just say uh, I'm a builder, I've got a house um, design and 6.7 stars. I've um, watched the first video in this series or first webinar in this series, and I've built the house, no thermal breaks, did the insulation properly. It's nice and tight, put in the correct windows. And I should be able to see that six point star rating in the amount of um, or the less heating and cooling would need by about that much. So there we go, 6.7. So you can see the little star marks here. So whatever your house design is, if you think you built it to that the right standard, you can start dialing up or taking away some of this pie. This is how this particular thing works. So now here we are at 6.7 stars. Now on this build, um, the build is also able to put in uh, reverse cycle air conditioning throughout an average coefficient performance of three. So effectively he can provide this much space heating and cooling with about a third of the power. So we just rub out two thirds there. Okay, on water heating, he was able to convince the clients to put in a four star shower head, but they had an, a, an old washing machine that they wanted to bring from an older house and reuse. So um, he can maybe get 15, you know, half of half of that little pie. That's see this black line. That's my 30% saving for 15% of shower and 15% um, there for a washing machine. But my builder here, he was able to go and get a Stiebel Eltron um, uh, heat pump hot water system, and effectively that's got a coefficient performance approaching four. So he was able to provide this much hot water with you know, about a bit under a quarter of the energy. Lighting, we put in LEDs or he put in LEDs. Um, so he was able to grab that little bit. Cooking, couldn't convince the owners to go away from gas. They like gas um, and they had their own appliances. Okay, so that's the job. The next step in doing this is to bunch all of these wedges together. And now all you do is you just start reading around in a clockwise direction. It's two kilowatt panel system, four kilowatt panel system, five will be in there somewhere. So somewhere around five and a half on this particular example, this house should start breaking even as long as it's been built properly to perform as per the star rating. And it's had these efficient um, heating appliances and things, uh, energy uh, prevention measures. <laughs> 
used on the house. Um, now, the next thing to do on this bit, bit of thing is to back yourself a little bit or, or cover a little bit of risk and just uh, the vagaries of, um, of real world application and to round up. So round up to six kilowatt panel. So that's probably where I'd be starting the conversation with owners and say, put on six kilowatts. Having said that, I did, um, one of my solar installers did contact me in the week and he said, Jeremy, I hope you're just gonna tell them to put on as much solar as they can. Um, and there's a real point to that because solar power and making your own power just has so many uses and applications in the house. So it does make sense to put on pretty much as much as you can. However, this is the way this works. Now, there's two more provisos to this. This works for the average 200 square meter house. If you've got a bigger house, I'd add two kilowatts of panel for every 100 square meters that you add. If you add 50 square meters, maybe just one more kilowatt of panel. And for two kilowatt, uh, sorry, also add if you have more than three bedrooms, which is the average house has three bedrooms. If you have more than that, add another two kilowatts because the potential of more people to be living in that house over time exists. And you can also use this little thing to work out how much panel size that needs on your roof as well. I can see I'm starting to uh, approach time, Hamish, so I'm going to start um, wrapping it up shortly. Um, all right, I will go, I will avoid which panels and which inverters to choose, only to say um, Solar quotes, I, I, I have no affiliation with any of these panels and I'm not an expert though I've used uh, a lot of these things before. Um, but I found that this channel on YouTube has pretty good information, um, but watch it, make your own choices. I've used the Fronius, the disease inverse Fronius, uh, SMA, Solar Edge. I found them all pretty good. Um, but the important thing that um, uh, Mr. Solar Quote says is, try and get this 10 year warranty, go, go for a 10 year warranty. Um, most, well, some of them will already come with a 10 year warranty. This is, uh, we're talking about inverters now. Sorry, I, I skipped ahead a little bit. So we're talking about the inverters um, and the solar panels. Try and get a system that has a 10 year warranty uh, to it. Sometimes it'll only be a five year warranty and you can pay a little bit more to upgrade to that 10 year. One of the pitfalls that I'd say if you haven't put on solar panels before is just watch out for overshadowing. If you do have overshadowing, um, if you choose the wrong sort, what can happen is that um, this could be what they call a, str a string setup. These could all be linked in series. And the, if one of the panels goes down because of shade, the whole string um, goes down to that level of output. So if shade is an issue for you, um, the solution, instead of getting a string inverter, talk to your installer, discuss micro inverters. They sit on the back of each panel and they basically regulate it so that the one in shade will drop in output, but the others won't. A little, another little tip is don't install inverters in a sunny position. If they get hot, they don't work as well and it will probably reduce the life of the inverter. Uh, a couple of quick tips. Um, if you are installing on a tile roof, you may find it difficult to find contractors because tiles break easily. Make sure you've got a lot of old tiles to replace handy and check it afterwards so it doesn't say uh, you don't have leaks. Uh, if you're on a flat system, a flat roof, you're likely to pay $500 more for the tilt system. Uh, oh, and this one is important. Check system size limits with asset owners. One of the issues at the moment for the asset owners is that with all the solar systems that are going in, they can get too much power being produced in the middle of the day and they've had to limit output. And in some places you're not allowed to output or you're only allowed to output up to a five kilowatt system. So that, so that will give you a, a maximum system size that you're allowed on your house. If you do have a three phase, um, system to your house though, if you're on three phase power, typically they'll let you do that five kilowatt limit to each phase. So you can have up to 15 kilowatts normally and sometimes up to 30 kilowatts. Uh, I won't talk about 
this too much because I have done a post on it and I'm aware of time. Only to say that you're making all of your power, a lot of power in the middle of the day now. Start thinking to yourself or educating your owners to think of their house a little bit like a battery. You're making this power in the middle of the day. What can you use it on? Well, let's shunt it to that heat pump hot water. Let's put it in there. Okay, the hot water's hot. Now what can we do with it? Okay, let's put on the, you know, the heating um, to heat the home or cool the home in summer. When the sun goes down, turn it off and our great insulation that we talked about in the first webinar will hold that heat um, within the house. Um, and also the future is very close. We're doing a project, our next project, we're hoping to incorporate this and that is an electric car. Cars, electric cars are actually battery packs on wheels. Um, and this is what's coming, something called V2H, which is vehicle to home or V2G, vehicle to grid. I'm not quite sure which naming convention is going to win out there, but keep an eye on that because it was a technology where the power from your house, when your car's plugged in, you can put it into your car um, and potentially you can run your house off your car and use that. And that way you don't necessarily potentially need to have big battery packs as well on your home, your car will be your battery pack. And just to be ready for this future, I would suggest everyone, here's a low hanging fruit, put in a 32 amp cable that runs from your meter box to wherever you think the car charger is likely to be. Ask the owner where they want it and just leave it in the wall for that time when they get an electric car. And in your meter box, leave two free circuit spots uh, at least so that they can connect up that circuit and, um, and the 32 amp will give you fast charge capability. So you've offset with photovoltaics, well done. You should be very close now to carbon neutral, potentially carbon positive over the year. Um, here's one, um, one idea, if, if you're not quite there, the amount of energy that this house will be drawing from the grid won't be substantial. And if owners are disappointed all that they're not 100% carbon neutral, just tell them to get uh, pay the five cent extra premium for a kilowatt per uh, for green power. And effectively for what won't cost them very much because they're not using much power, that would take away any shortfall from this rule of thumb sort of system. And effectively mean that their carbon footprint is Pretty much gone. So well done, high performance living. And I, I guess what I was trying to do in this webinar and on this series is really give a message of hope for our industry to say that all the technology that we need is actually already here. It's just a matter of applying it. And these aren't hard things to do. It's just a matter of just maybe incorporating one or two new ideas in each time you build, you know, three or four homes later, uh, you, know, you too could be a, a, a builder who's building very energy efficient homes and being raved about by your clients. So um, that's it. I, you might notice here, minimize embodied energy is also on this roadmap. We will get to that sometime down the track. All right, everyone, um, the road is open. Time to drive. Back to you, Hamish.